Good day students, welcome to mathgotserve.com. In this clip, we're going to be going over problems one to five of the geometry January 2015 New York Regents released examination. All right, let's take a look at problem number one. It says, what is the solution of the system of equations graphed below? So we have um, a system of equations y equals 2x plus 1, this is a line, and we have a parabola or quadratic, y equals x squared plus 2x minus 3. Now, one thing you want to note is that um, when you're given a graph and you ask for the solution, the solution is represented by the points of intersection of the two graphs, okay? So, what are the coordinates of the points of intersection? The steps we will use to solve this problem, step number one, we'll first um, identify the points of intersection, and then secondly, we will read off the coordinates of the points, and that will be our solution, all right? So let's take a look at this graph right here. We have an intersection here. Let's call that um, point one. That's our first intersection. And then we have another intersection right here. Let's call that point two. So the coordinates of these two points will be the solution to the system of equations. All right, so let's go ahead and find what the coordinates of these points are. Uh, we'll just trace it to the x-axis. So trace this point to the x-axis right here, and then trace that to the y-axis, and then trace this point to the y, and then trace this point to the um, x-axis. So that will help us determine the coordinates of our um, graph. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> so we have, just give me one second here, 4.1. If we trace it to the x-axis, 1, 2, that's negative 2 since we're going in the negative x direction. And then if we go down 1, 2, 3, that's negative 3. So that tells us the coordinates of our first point of intersection. So P1 has coordinates negative 2 for the x and negative 3 for the y. And then um, for the second one, P2, uh, this is 1, 2, 2 for the x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and that's positive 5. So P2 has coordinates uh, of 2, comma, 5. So since the points of intersection of the two graphs are our solutions, um, those are what we're going to put down. Okay, so solutions are negative 2, comma, negative 3, the first point, and 2, comma, 5. All right, let's take a look at problem number two. So for problem two, it reads, what are the coordinates of the midpoint of the line segment with endpoints 2, negative 5, and 8, 3? So uh, one thing you want to note when you're finding midpoints of a segment given the coordinates of the endpoints is that you do not need a visual. You do not need to graph um, to graph um, the coordinates, I mean, to graph the segment in order to determine what the midpoint is, okay? You can uh, simply apply the formula. That should suffice. All right, so these are the steps we're going to use. First thing you want to do is write down the midpoint formula. Some of you might want to skip directly to the application, but it's important to write down the formula so you do not switch uh, the coordinate values, okay? And then secondly, you label your coordinates, substitute into the formula, and evaluate your midpoint. Okay, so first thing to do is write down the midpoint formula. It's basically the recipe that we use to generate the value of the midpoint of the given segment. So um, step one, let's write down what our formula is. <clears throat> so formula is uh, for the midpoint. given by the average of the x-coordinates, x1 plus x2 over 2, okay? 
and the average of the y's, y1 plus y2 over 2. Okay, so there goes your midpoint formula. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to write down our coordinates and label the values. So let's call our first point P1. So point 1, P1 has coordinate values 2, negative 5. So what does that tell us? It tells us that x1, the x coordinate of point 1 is 2, and the y coordinate, y1 of point 1, is negative 5. Notice that the indices are consistent, 1, 1, 1. That's the reason for that, okay? It's telling you that that's the first point. And then for P2, the second point, 8, 3. Now, the nice thing about this formula is you don't, the order doesn't really matter. You can call this P1, P2, or call this P2, P1. It doesn't matter. You will get the same answer, okay? So what will this be? This will be X2. The X coordinate of the second point is 8. And uh, Y2, the Y coordinate of the second point is 3. Now we've listed everything we need so we don't make mistakes when we are plugging it into the formula, okay? So let's rewrite the formula. Um, the midpoint M of <clears throat> P1, P2. So we can just write it as an index. Midpoint of segment P1, P2 is given by X1 plus X2. You add these two. 2 plus 8 over 2. Okay? Basically looking for the average. And then... Y2, Y1 plus Y2 over 2, negative 5 plus 3 over 2. All right, now we're going to use the order of operations to simplify this. 2 plus 8 is 10 divided by 2, comma, negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2 over 2. Simplify that further. 10 over 2 is 5, negative 2 over 2 is negative 1. Our answer. 5, negative 1 is option number 4. All right, let's take a look at problem 3. It reads, as shown in the diagram below, when hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F is reflected over line M, the image is hexagon A, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, E prime, F prime. Under this transformation, which property is not preserved, okay? So you want to be careful with the question. This is asking for which property is not preserved. Now, what kind of isometry um, is a line reflection, okay? I talk about isometry because isometry basically means that the measurements are unchanged. If you look at these two, when you reflect something, do you change the size if, it's, if the reflection is about a line? When you reflect something about a line, it's an isometry because the measures do not change, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Now, one thing you want to note is that orientation basically refers to the order of the letters. When you're reading the vertices of the shape, either clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, in this problem, A, B, C, D, E, F, they were reading the vertices off in a clockwise fashion. Okay, so that's the orientation of the vertices. So if, you, if that's how it's done from 1, from A all the way counterclockwise, you have A, B, C, D, E, F. If you want to compare the um, original image, the object with the image, you start from A prime, and then you you proceed in a counterclockwise, in a clockwise fashion also. Okay, so uh, if you compare those to you, that's how you can determine if the order is preserved. Now, um, steps that we're going to use is we just basically exhaust the options that we have. We consider, you know, what's um, is preserved under whatever kind of transformation we're given, and then we'll apply to this case, okay? So, one thing you want to note is that under uh, line 
reflection. Um, line reflection is basically an isometry and only the um, is an opposite isometry and only the measures are preserved. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, write that down. So a line reflection, <clears throat> line reflection, line reflections are are opposite isometries. All right. So um, if you look at the word isometry, <clears throat> what does that tell you? It's a combination of two, two different words. Iso means the same. Metry means measure. Okay. So isometry means all the measures are, are going to be um, the same or preserved. So if all the measures are preserved, what do you know about the area? Is the area going to change if all the measures are preserved? The answer is yes. Uh, no, the area does not change. Okay, area stays the same. This is preserved. How about the distance? Like the distance between any two points on these two hexagons. Do they change? The answer is no. The distance is preserved because all the measures, metry, are identical or equal or ISO. Okay. How about orientation? That's what we we're talking about earlier. This right here is A, B, C, D, E, F in a clockwise orientation. A, B, C, D, E, F. And if we start from A here, what do we have? A prime, F prime, E prime, D prime, C prime, B prime. Now we know that A corresponds to A, B prime corresponds to B. Are they in order here? The answer is no. You notice that the orientation is not preserved. Corresponding angles are not in the same order as they were before. B was to the right of A here, and guess what? It's to the left of um, B here. It's just like looking at the mirror, everything is kind of switched around the orientation. I uh, switched around, that's exactly what's happening here, okay? So the opposite part of this isometry, the def definition of or explanation of linear reflections, opposite is referring to the orientation because the orientation becomes opposite. So what does that tell us? Is the orientation preserved? Is the order the same as the object? The answer is no. So this is not preserved, okay? Now, how about angular measure? Even though the order of the orientation of the angular measures are reversed, are their sizes altered? The answer is no. Remember, we talked about metries, measures. Measures are identical. So angle A is congruent to angle A prime, and then angle B is congruent to B prime. All the angles are identical. There is there is no change um, in the measurement of the angles. All right. So for option four, the angle measures are preserved. So what is our answer? Our answer is option three because that is the only measure, I mean the only um, property that is not preserved under line reflection. All right, let's take a look at problem number four. <clears throat> for problem four, it reads in the diagram of triangle ABC below, BD is drawn to side AC. So this segment BD is drawn to side AC. If measure of angle A is 35, a measure of angle ABD is 25, and a measure of angle C is 60, what type of triangle is triangle BCD? Is it equilateral, obtuse, scaling, or right? Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's put in the measures that we have. Angle A is 35. Angle A, B, D is 25. And angle C is 60. Now, one thing you want to note is that scaling triangles uh, have no um, equal side measures. Okay, so no pair of sides are congruent in a scaling triangle. So how does that impact the angular measure? 
Since no sides are equal, that means that no angles are equal. All the angles have different measures, okay? This is like the exact opposite of equilateral, where everything is equal, the side measures and the angles, but scaling means none of them, no pair, are, um, is equal, okay? So these are the steps we're going to use. We're going to find the measures of all the angles of triangle B, C, D, and that will be the tool that we'll use to classify this triangle right here, okay? We have only one angle right here, which is um, 60 degrees, so we're going to go ahead and uh, figure out the measures of the remaining angle. <clears throat> All right, so before I go over the step-by-step -step determination of the values of the angles in triangle BCD, let me show you a shortcut you can use um, real quick if you don't want to do too much work. Now, one thing, if you have a, two triangles in this orientation, now uh, the interior angle here is normally the sum of the two exterior angles, okay? Because this interior angle forms a linear pair with this um, angle here, so they're both supplementary, and these three angles are supplementary in this triangle, so this angle is a supplement of these two, and this angle is a supplement of that angle, so the sum of these two angles will give you this angle right here. So you just add these two, 25 plus 35, that gives you 60 here, and then you have 60, 60, and that's 60. And as an equilateral triangle, your answer is option number one. Okay? So that's how you do it if you want to just do it quickly um, in your head. So let me show you the steps, step-by-step -step, uh, determination of the whole process. So in order to find out the angles, the value of the angles um, of triangle BCD, we have to first of all find out what this angular measure is this triangle BDA, okay? So what we know is that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 by the triangle angle sum theorem. So measure of angle A plus measure of angle uh, ABD plus measure of angle BDA is equal to what? What do you get when you add the three angles of a triangle? Is 180. Okay, based on the triangle angle sum theorem. So let's plug in the values of what we know and figure out what we need. Okay, angle A is 35 plus angle ABD is 25 plus measure of angle BDA. We do not know what that is. <coughs> BDA equals 180. So we add these two together, you get 60 plus. The measure of angle BDA, and then you subtract 60 from both sides. Measure of angle BDA is 120 degrees. Okay, nice. So we put that in there. Now, next thing we want to do is we want to figure out the measure of angle BDC. Okay. Angle BDC and BDA are a linear pair. What does that mean? It means that they are supplementary. So measure of angle BDA plus measure of angle BDC is equal to 180 degrees because they form a linear pair, okay? So let's plug in what we need and find what, we, uh, let's plug in what we know which is that measure of angle BDA is 120, and then we're going to find what we need, which is measure of angle BDC. Okay, so you simply subtract 120 degrees from both sides, and that yields the measure of angle BDC. <clears throat> angle BDC 180 minus 120 is 60 degrees. Excellent. That's what we came up with earlier, right? So, hope you can see that this is 60 degrees. Now, what is the sum of angles in a triangle is 180? 60 plus 60 plus uh, 60 gives you 180. Okay, let me show you the work. So, to show you the work, measure of angle C plus measure of angle BDC plus measure of angle uh, DBC 
equals what? 180. Using the triangle angle sum theorem again that we used first, okay? So we know that measure of angle C is 60 degrees. Measure of VDC from what we got before is 60 degrees. And then um, what we need to find is measure of angle DBC. Add them all together, you get 180, okay? 60 plus 60 is 120 plus measure of angle BDC, I mean DBC is 180. You subtract 120 from both sides, you get measure of angle DBC, which is equal to 60 degrees, okay? Now, what kind of triangle is triangle BCD? Triangle BCD is 60, 60, 60. If the three angles are congruent, what do we know about the sides? The three sides are congruent also. So what do you, <clears throat> what is the name of a triangle where all the sides are equal? It's known as an equilateral triangle. Okay, so since all the uh, angles are equal, that means all the sides are equal. So that means this is an equilateral triangle. Okay, remember, equilateral triangles are um, equiangular and all the sides are also equal to. So keep that in mind. All right, let's take a look at problem number five. It says in the diagram below, of rhombus ABCD, the diagonals AC and BD intersect at E. If AC is 18 and BD is 24, what is the length of one side of rhombus ABCD? Okay, so we just want to figure out the length of any one side. Now, one thing you want to note is that the diagonals of rhombuses intersect at 90 degrees. Okay, so let's take a look at this shape we have here. So they intersect at 90 degrees. So this is 90, 90, 90, 90. All right, diagonals intersect at 90 degrees. What else do we know about a rhombus? A rhombus is a square. Um, I'm sorry. A rhombus is um, <coughs> a special kind of quadrilateral where all four sides are the same. All squares are rhombuses, but not all rhombuses are squares, okay? A square is a special case of a rhombus where um, it's equilateral and equiangular. But um, rhombuses are just equilateral, they're not equiangular, okay? So what am I saying? Uh, I'm just basically saying that the measures of all four sides are congruent for all rhombuses, okay? So all four sides are congruent. So if we find any one side, that will suffice, okay? That's why the problem says find the length of one side because if you know one side, you know all the sides, all right? So let's use the values we have to populate um, this triangle, this um, rhombus right here. AC is um, 18, BD is 24. Now, another thing you want to note about the rhombus is that diagonals bisect each other, okay? So they intersect at 90 degrees and they also bisect each other. Now, these are the steps we are going to use for this problem. We're going to try to extract a triangle, one of a, a triangle from um, this rhombus right here, apply the measurements, and then figure out the length of a missing side. Now, one thing to note about this, let me show it to you real quick. Since these diagonals bisect each other, this, side, this segment AE is congruent to this segment right here, okay? And this segment EB is congruent to this segment right here. So what you have is four congruence triangles using SSS um, similarity postulate, okay? These four triangles are congruent. Okay, so we just want to extract one and solve for um, a side length, namely the hypotenuse, and that will be our final answer, okay? So we know that, um, let's see. Uh, what do we have? AC is 18. Um, so what does that tell us? If AC is 18, since diagonals bisect each other, um, AE is going to be half of that. Okay, so let's write that down. Since diagonals bisect each other, diagonals of rhombuses, <laughs> Bisect each other. Uh, 
then um, AE is going to be one half of the entire diagonal, which is AC. And AC is um, 18 units long. So AE is half as long as that. So you divide 18 by 2, which is 9. Okay, so AE is 9. If AE is 9, how long is EC? Is 9 also, okay? They're both congruent and they add up to 18. Now, how about BE? What's the story with BE? We know that BD is 24 units long. So BE is what? What's the relationship between BE and the length of BD? B, um, e is one half of BD because segment AC bisects BD right down the center. Okay, so to find BE, we just find one half of BD, which is 24, or divide 24 by 2 and get 12. So that means BE is 12, and guess what? BE is 12 also. All right. Um, so now we can just extract one triangle, a right triangle, and then um, apply the Pythagorean theorem in solving the last side. Okay, so I just extracted uh, one of the triangles. Let's uh, label the sides. I extracted triangle AEB. So this right here is triangle AEB. I extracted it so you, you all can see exactly what I'm doing. So this side right here is 9. This is 12. And AB is what we're looking for, okay? <clears throat> so if this is big A, let's call this little A. If this is big B, let's call this little B. If this is big E, let's call this little E, the measure we need to find. Now remember, anytime you're solving a right triangle given two sides, you always use the Pythagorean theorem. That always works, okay? Given two sides, if you want to find the third side, um, <clears throat> use the Pythagorean theorem, okay? So what is the Pythagorean theorem? Pythagorean theorem is A square plus B square equals C square. A and B are the leg C is the um, hypotenuse, okay? So let me write this in blue. So we have the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, if we apply that to this problem, the legs, you can call this A, B, and C. Okay, the longest side is C, the side opposite the 90 degrees, and the other two are A and B. It doesn't really matter um, what you call A or B. They're interchangeable, okay? But C is always the longest side. So we have um, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So we're going to have, applying this formula to this problem, we're going to have A squared plus B squared equals e square. All right, let's freeze for a minute. Some of you might say, what is this? Well, in this problem, if you apply the Pythagorean theorem, a is a, b is b, e is c, the hypotenuse, okay? So please don't get stuck to these alphabets. They change all the time depending on the triangular situation, okay? All right, let's plug in the values. a is 12 square plus b is 9 square equals e square. Okay, now we're just going to solve this um, algebraic equation for E. 12 squared is 144. 9 squared is 81. <clears throat> so 81 equals E squared. 144 plus 81 is 225. So E squared equals 225. And then you take the square root of both sides. To isolate E, E is 15. Bam. There goes your final answer. So what does this mean? It basically means that the measure of um, all the sides of this rhombus is 15. So 15, 15, 15, 15. Remember, all rhombuses are equilateral. Okay? It's only a square that's equiangular also. So yeah, our, our answer is option number one. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. We really appreciate it. We we'll like your feedback. We we'll like to know what you think about this clip. Um, if you liked it, please give us a thumbs up. 
uh, we appreciate the positive feedback. Um, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for updates to the remainder of the parts of this review series. More clips can be found on mathgotserve.com under test prep. If you have any questions about this video or any of the questions on the geometry um, regions, just place a question in the comment section below and we'll be glad to address it as soon as we can. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.